This is the last of the I Have Decided messages. Pastor Mark, you've done such an awesome job. So good, really good. And, uh, you know, as we were just talking, I kind of had, just as I was praying and thinking, I just kind of had this, um, just something in my heart that I thought, well, you know what, I've made some major decisions, and, you know, they've been really key things in my spiritual walk, and I'd like to share them. So, Pastor Mark and I were sitting down, you know, at home the other night, and we began to talk and speak, and, you know, he goes, I really think that you need to come up, and you need to come and, and preach this. So, I'm going to talk today on some major life decisions, and I'm not going to talk too long. I do have, I'm working on talking shorter, so I've just started my little stopwatch here, and um, yeah, working on it. Yeah, where you, here we go. But um, as I got in there, I got onto, I wanted to go into the internet and just see what some people's major life decisions are, so I just went into Google and I put major life decisions, and all kinds of things came up. There was, you know, the top 10 major life decisions, this top 25 major life decisions, the top 12 to major life decisions, the top 11, I don't know I didn't get 11, but anyways, and, you know, the top five, and then there was one that was like the top 100, so I kind of just looked at them, and I got some of the pieces together, and I'm, I'm just going to share some of what I got from the internet, and then we're going to just talk about the major life decisions that I made in my life, and uh, where it brought me, and, and how the course of my life changed, so is that okay? Um, the first one I want to start with, this is actually really funny, your ten, 100 most important choices, and I'm not going to do all 100, I promise you, but I just, you know, this is a list of 100 choices or decisions that um, some of them seem really important, and others, like, maybe aren't very, ins they're not significant at all, and you think, well, why are they important? But when you look at each of them, they actually make they, they all fit together and make who you are and, and the kind of decisions that you've made. So, um, you know, even though they're kind of insignificant, some of them, they do affect something about you and really do change the course of your life. I'm going to just um, pick out a few of them here. Uh, how often you call home. <laughs> the books you read. Your posture how much or how little you smile. Yeah, what you watch on television and how much you watch. How much you exercise, whether you argue more than you should. <laughs> Which telephone calls you return. That is, you know, it affects what happens if you don't return that call from your in-laws. That's going to affect your life, right? So how late you stay up at night. What time you get up in the morning? I won't talk about that one right now. <laughs> um, how well you listen to others? Whether you gossip? How well are you able to concentrate? How fast you drive? That will really determine <laughs> how long you live, doesn't it, right? Whether you're a leader or a follower? How organized are you? How much time do you spend with your kids? Who do you admire most? Where do you buy your groceries and why? How often you eat out? Whether you give free advice. I mean, they're all crazy. How do, you, how do you spend your holidays? How do you use your credit cards? Who controls the conversation? How much do you worry? What gets you angry? How often you complain? What movies do you watch? How often you get a haircut? Whether you eat breakfast? What do you do when someone's made a big mistake? When do you start Christmas shopping? All these little things, they seem so little, but they affect you. You know, when you eat, how much you eat, how you give, all those things. Uh, I took a, a look, and I, I like this one. This was the top 10 major life decisions, and they're, they're up here. Number one, the decision to marry and commit your life to one individual. The choice of that individual. Number two, the decision to have kids. Huge life decision. We made that decision more than once. <laughs> the choice of your friends. Number four, the choice of emotional proximity to family. How emotionally connected are you going to be with your family? That's going to really 
And we know all kinds of families where there's dynamics happening, where the relationships are, I love you, you know. Give your family, if there's a family member here, give them a hug, find them, get close, make the proximity happen. I'm here. Um, the choice of your career path, the choice of your health and how it influences lifestyle and exercise and diet on all kinds of things, the choice of your spirituality or religion, the choice of location, where you live. Do you live in town? Do you live out of town? Do you live in the country, the city? Well, we all know we all live here. But anyways, the choice of ho hobbies or activities and the choice that you do in, the, in that fiscal direction, your financial matters, you know, whether you just live on the edge all the time or whether you're a saver, whether you manage your debt or you, well, do I have any, really? You know, these are all major decisions. Then I looked, I like this one. This is the top five major life decisions. And this one's really good. Well, how did my clock disappear? There it is. Number one, I love this. Choose a managed life, not a random one. Who here, you choose a managed life. You manage your life well. That's going to take you in a complete different direction than if you're like, oh, well, come see, come saw, whatever happens, and oh, where am I again, right? Number two, choose a commitment to happy, happiness-oriented practices. Decide to be happy. Live happy. I love that. Number three, choose a healthy, suitable career. Don't go and work where you don't like it and you're going to be a grouch. You know what? Be happy. It's going to change your whole life. Work somewhere you like. I know I'm speaking to someone here. I see lots of smiles and nods. <sighs> Number four, choose a healthy, suitable relationship. And they say partner. You know, and I, I believe marriage, but still, people that you're going to connect with and, and do life with. Number five, choose a health protocol that creates the very best vehicle for carrying you through your life. And again, that's diet and exercise. And so just in that top five and the top 10, we, we saw at least three of those repeated, right? So um, I came up with a list of the decisions I made in my life. And um, they're major. Those are decisions that I consider major. I looked at them, thought about them for a long time. I'm sure there's more that I can think of later. But I came up with my top 10 and it, it involves my faith and it involves my God because that is the number one decision. So let's just pray. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you have created us and you have given each one of us a free will. Lord, that you've created us to choose, to, to um, work with our hands, to dream, to create, to express, oh God. That you don't want ro robots, oh God. That you've given us that freedom of choice. And Lord, I just pray as we look at this, this closing wrap-up message just to the I Have Decided series, that you would speak to hearts, including mine, oh God, and, and just areas where we just need to maybe shift or, or choose better than we have in the past, oh God. Lord, because we know that every choice is just like a ladder. It takes us to the next step, oh God. So Lord, I just pray a blessing over each one of my brothers and sisters, oh God, that you would just open up their eyes and their ears of their understanding, that you would just touch them their heart and that the word of God would go down and produce good lasting fruit in Jesus name and everyone said amen well I'm going to go through these as quick as I can um, some of these pastor Mark has already talked about them and I'm just going to uh, touch on them briefly briefly I might expound a little bit more on others but I'm going to pretty well go fast I've got all the scripture references up there so that you can um, and just write them down. So, um, number one, I myself personally have decided to become a Christ follower. That's the decision that I made when I was eight years old, and I rededicated my life to the Lord when I was 25, and I gave Him my life 100%. Following means you can't follow two things at once. If I've got you know, if Charlotte's going this way and I've got Matthew going this way in their car and they're, they're, they're going out the, the, the highway, the turn off to, from Living Way onto the highway and Charlotte turns left and, and Matthew turns right, I can't follow both. 
I can only follow one of them. And so I decided in my life that I'm going to be a Christ follower. I'm going to put him first and follow him and his ways over anything else. Matthew 16, 24 says in the New Living Translation, Jesus then said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower... You must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. And Pastor Mark gave an awesome message on being totally just a Christ follower. It is up on YouTube. There's Our YouTube channel is called Living Way Life Church. That's Living Way Life Church. Living Way Christian Center was taken or for some reason or not, but that's what it is. And that message is there if you want to hear more about just being a Christ follower. The other thing that I have decided to do, I have decided to be planted in the local church. And planted in the local church talks about my commitment to God's house, my commitment to stay no matter what, my commitment to stay in relationships here, my commitment to tithe here, my commitment to serve here, my commitment to grow here, even when I don't feel like it. And you think, you don't feel like it? Oh, yeah. There's days I don't feel like it. And you know what? I found out there's, you know, sometimes over the summer we have to go to soccer games and I don't get here maybe every single Sunday. I find the Sundays when I've missed one Sunday and then two Sundays, those are the third Sunday. That's when I don't want to be here. And I could come up with a whole pile of other reasons why I want to stay home or organize my bathroom cupboard or go and get a coffee or whatever. But the point is, you know what? I have made that decision over my feelings, no matter what, that I am going to be committed. I've made that decision that I'm going to tithe, that I'm going to give to this house with my worship, with my praise, with my confession, with my words, with my love, with my gifts, and I'm planted here. Psalm 92, 13, I love this scripture. It is so powerful. New King James Version, for those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. And I am so thankful for the godly examples that God has given me in this house of my mom and my father-in-law, Bernice, uh, Willine, and, and just some of the others where I see them flourishing in their, I don't want to see old age, but in their wiser, mature age. And I want to be like that too. I want to be going to Africa or praying or just so strong in the water of God that I'm a pillar and an encouragement to others. Psalm 84 verse 4 says, blessed are those who dwell in your house. There is actual, a tangible presence of God. And there's actually a tangible blessing that actually happens on your life when you are committed. You don't just come. And there's times when you do just come. But you, you're planted and you're committed and you choose to love the church. You know, there, there is a, there's a book for married people after they just get married for those young couples and it's called it's called help me out it's called love is a choice the act of love what was it it's called the act of love and the point is as 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 married couples we need to decide and we need to act in love same thing when you're committed to the church you don't always feel it but you need to act in love anyways yeah. the feelings will come they're like the caboose they will show up um, Psalm 69, 9 says, the passion for your house has consumed me. And it is people say, how do you do it? Pastor Ray, how come? Like, I couldn't even do, you know what? I'm consumed with the church. I love the church. And people in the world might say that's nuts, but you know what? I love the church. I love it that we're lining five young people up in the front row and I get to stand next to Jerrica. <laughs> And Sean, and I get to worship with him. And I get to see people when they have change in their life and answered prayer. I love that. Uh, number three, I have decided to become, to be a doer of God's word. I believe God's word is the final authority. And so because of that, I make a concentrated effort. It doesn't always happen, but I've decided to get the word of God into me. And so what I'll do is I'll do whatever I can to get in it. If I'm in a busy season, ask my kids, 
I'll get tapes and stick them in. I'll be driving back and forth between Oliver and Living Way. And they're like, oh, Mom, we listened to that Lisa Bevere session number one three times already. I know, but it's so good. You know, we need to get the Word of God into us. There's all kinds of resources. You can go online. You can get podcasts. You can all that. And there's also, of course, just old school, the Bible getting that Bible and reading it, just reading the Word of God and getting in your heart. But you don't do that unless you have a Bible reading plan, a daily plan. So that's something that I have really done over the years, probably maybe about five, six years ago, I really solidified my Bible reading plan. And that's something that has really uh, brought a lot of fruit in my life. Um... And I'm obedient to God's word, not just listening to his word, but doing it. And sometimes it's not so easy to do that because it it requires um, humility. It requires you to serve others and 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 give. So Second uh, Timothy three sixteen to seventeen. This is in the Message translation, and I think this is so good. It says every part of Scripture is God breathed and useful, one way or the other. God's word is useful. It's not dead. And if you faith is simply going, it's useful and useful, and I need it, and I'm going to take it, and then reading it. If you read your Bible every day, just think about something that's useful to you, and God will give it to you. Every part of the scripture is God breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion. Who's got rebellion? We do. Correcting our mistakes. Who makes mistakes? We do. And training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks that God has us for has for us to do. So you want to do what God wants you to do? Just read his word. Just listen to his word, and you will. Number four, so I have decided to live a spirit-filled life. Making the decision to live a spirit-filled life means that you've decided to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the full presence of God in your life that you've decided to pray in the Spirit, and that you step out and make that step. I remember that day when I was 25, after I had given my life to Jesus Christ. I remember uh, Pastor Mark came over to my house. We had like a chicken dinner or something like that. I don't know what we did. And he told me about, taught me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I remember being in Vancouver and lifting up my hands in my kitchen and receiving in faith the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I remember being filled, and I remember beginning to pray in my heavenly language, and that day, from that day on, the scriptures opened up to me, I felt the leading of the Spirit in my life, and there was just such a rich presence of God in my life, and that is something that I decided to do. Was it easy? It kind of seemed weird. It was a little different, but I took that step, and, and that is something that changed my life. Uh, Ephesians 5 verses 18 to 19 says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here they're talking about having so much in your life that you're literally filled, you're saturated. You know, if I filled somebody with that much wine, they would die, right? That's But when you fill yourself with the Spirit of God, so strong, you actually have life, and there's blessing, and the Holy Spirit works in your life and just brings revelation, and it's so powerful. Uh, Ephesians 6.18 says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. You know, sometimes we don't know what to pray, but when we begin to pray in our heavenly language, the Spirit of God prays through us, and we begin to see what we need, and he gives us that revelation and that need, that leading of his presence. Number five, I've decided to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what? It's not easy, especially being a woman. You know what? I made that decision a long time ago. I remember when I just came back to the Lord, I was 25. It started with I decided to go into little lambs, two- and three-year-old nursery. And I went in, and I went in, and I went in. And slowly after five, six months, then they asked me to go into the kids on, I don't know what it was called, super church. 
And I went in there. And then slowly they asked Pastor Mark and I to be kids pastors. And then it was youth ministry. But you know what? I decided at a, at a, as a very young Christian that I was going to be a minister of the gospel, that God was going to work through me to change lives. You know what? All we need to do is say we're available. He'll empower us. He'll lead us. He will give us what we need to say when we need to say it. And, you know, at the right time in different stages of my life, God presented the situations that I needed. For example, the Rama online, uh, not online, the Correspondence Bible School that I needed, and then just the different things that we went through with the Wagner Leadership Institute and going on mission trips and the different opportunities that I learned from practical ministry. But you know what? Make that decision in your heart. That decision requires several things. It requires you to separate yourself. And it's not always easy choosing, making that decision to be a minister of the gospel. You know, sometimes you don't feel like ministering the love of Jesus to somebody else. Sometimes you feel like you've got your own issues. And you just need to continually stand up and make that decision to pour into somebody else. <clears throat> it requires serving. You know what? And serving where you don't want to serve. You just got to serve. And when you don't want to serve, and how you don't want to serve, you know, and, but there is always a blessing when you serve. The other thing is just sharing your faith, just getting up and sharing your faith. Um, you know, whether it's just in through prayer, whether it's for praying for people when they're sick, whether it's just uh, ministering to young people or whatever it is, if you ask God, Lord, let me share my faith with someone today, I, I promise you he will send you somebody. Have you dared to take that risk? I'm challenging myself as I say that too. So uh, 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 to 5 says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. So you say, well, I'm just a new Christian. Well, you know what? You know more than the guy who isn't a Christian, right? Convince, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and teaching, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Number six, I have decided to marry God's choice for me. Now, I want to say before Mark was in my life, the choice of fellows that maybe I would date were not God's choice for me. They might have had a nice Jeep, or they were a fireman, or a cop, or one was a skydiver. But you know what? They weren't God's choice for me. God knew who I would begin to build my life with, and the ministry that would come forth, and the children that come when I come out of my life. And I made that choice to marry who God chose for me. And I've heard some, a lot of different preaching that, you know, um, that actually goes against that and says, well, you know, all these people are waiting for God's choice. Don't do that. Go with someone who, work, who it works and it fits. And, and you want to have a healthy, secure life partner to that you're going to build your life with. You don't want to get in a relationship with, in an unhealthy relationship where there's stress and turmoil, irresponsibility, there's no provision. You want to do that. But at the, you know, at the same time, you need to believe that God has got someone for you to marry. And that connection is going to bear fruit in your life. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 6 verses 4 to 15 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? When you're going to align your life with people that is going to go a long way, align it with someone with the same faith and belief. And, 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 and align it, not just that, with someone who, if you want to be committed to ministry, align it, your life, with someone who wants to be committed to ministry. Because there always will be tension and friction in those relationships. I know Pastor Mark talked about Cindy. She was the girl that, uh, he, she was a lovely girl before me that he had liked, and, and uh, she baked a lot more than I did. Um, 
<laughs> so I doubt it. But, but you know what? She did not have the same heart for ministry that he did. You know, uh, I was a new Christian, and I needed a lot of teaching. I needed the Word of God. But you know what? It was kind of neat because he was be able to to pour into me and and, and bring that teaching into my life as I grew and I was a new a new Christian. And you know what? It was kind of good because then I didn't get all the you know just some weird doctrines. I got good stuff. But anyways, so um, marry God's choice for you. Uh, number seven, the other uh, decision it says I have, and this not it says I have decided to leave a legacy. You know, something happened. I was an only child with a single mom. And um, you can imagine how dysfunctional that was. But anyway, she was a great woman. She's awesome. But there were hurts in our life, in my life. It was hard. I didn't have a dad. Um, I probably would have been very different if I hadn't had a dad. And uh, I'm so thankful for the awesome husband that God gave me because my kids have a great dad. I have a great husband, and they have an amazing dad. Um, but somewhere along the line, I remember years back, I remember if you guys remember uh, me here when we first came to, to Living Way, they would say, well, so when are you going to have kids? And I would <clears throat> front and uh, would be asked again and again. And I, I, and I remember this one lady, she asked me, and, and I, I, I asked her very kindly to please stop <laughs> asking me when I was going to have kids. Um, it was not something that in my heart that I wanted to do because I think there was a lot of fear in my life because of just the dynamics that were in my family upbringing. But God began to work in my heart, and I told Mark that I would have one, maybe two kids. <laughs> and, you know, we took it from there. So, but somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, it was God's leading in my life that he told me in my heart about the investment that I was making into the future. And you know what? It's not always convenient to have kids. It doesn't, not always warm and fuzzy. They're not always cute. Saturday, I was up at four in the morning because somebody got up sick in the middle of the night and I was the one who happened to have to deal with it. Praise God. But, you know, um, there was a point in my life that I decided that I wanted to have a lot of kids because I wanted that richness. I wanted the big, messy, loud Christmases. You know, I just, I, I wanted that in 20, 30 years that I'm going to grow old with lots of noise and maybe I'll have to have in extra insulation in our room. But I wanted that. There's something that I wanted about that. And, um, and also, not just that I wanted to have kids, but I wanted to leave a legacy. So from a young time, just as we have been parents, Pastor Mark and I have decided that we were going to raise godly kids no matter what, whether they liked us or not. I'm not my kid's friend. I'm their mom as they grow up. And they, I've got one now that's just in their 20s, Sydney. And I'm, you know, I think they're just starting to like me at that age. But you know what? My job is to train godly kids that will, that will, they too will raise godly generations. Um, Mark has had probably four or five year, generations or longer of 13, 15, 29, of godly generations and of ministry in his life. Myself, I didn't. I'm basically the, the first one in my generation. My mom came back came to the Lord after I did. And so even my own kids, even my own kids, there is a fight for their destiny. There's a fight that the God has their destiny, but the enemy wants that seed too. And so I continually am always like, they're like, oh, mom, you know, I'm always making sure, how's your devotional time? Let's get this message in the car and, okay, let's tie you down and put the headphones on you and listen to this message, you know. But but uh, no, it's not that bad. But you know what? It, it, there, it takes work to raise godly kids. And you'll tell them, you know what? You know, don't do this. Don't go that. And, you know, you shouldn't tweet this and don't text this. But you know what? It, it, I know in my heart when I do this that it, it, that it, it's, they're laughing at me back there, that, um, that I am creating godly generations. 
And not just my own kids, but I'm committed to the next generation. I've decided in my heart to build the next generation, all the way from when I was in Little Lambs with the twos and threes to hanging out with the, the youth group. I've done, I don't know, 20 plus years of youth ministry, and I still love it, and I'm still committed to it. Uh, I'm committed to imparting to others, and I'm committed to passing it on. That's the legacy. I want to know that when I die and I'm in heaven, that I can see those seeds of my faith being passed on all across the earth and all throughout generations. Psalm 78.4 says, We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power, about his mighty wonders. Psalm 127, verses 3 to 5 says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. And I believe that is so true. You know what? We, our children, we can send into the future. The children we can send into the future, into the enemy's camp, and bring back into God's kingdom those that are destined for greatness. And, um, you know, it, it is a commitment, it's work, but it's a decision that I put in my life, and uh, I'm still committed to it until the day I go to be with Jesus. So, number eight, I have decided to guard my heart. That's a decision that I made a long time ago. And I continue in it. It is not easy. Guarding your heart takes work. You know, in the area of repentance, I've made so many mistakes. I've done things and said things. And you know what? It just comes down to coming back to God and saying, God, please forgive me. God, I'm sorry. God, I made a mistake. You know what? We make mistakes in our marriage. We make mistakes in our parenting. We make mistakes in ministry. We make mistakes all the time. And we make mistakes with him. You know, sometimes we just don't put him first, and we just we need to get it right. Um, the other area, to guard your heart is from forgiveness. Repent for yourself. Forgive others. You know, and we just need to forgive. Choose not to be offended. I chose a long time ago not to be offended. Um, and I also chose to live in happiness. You know, we don't always feel happy, but we need to make that decision to be happy and to be content with what God has given us. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And probably out of everything here, I mean, I don't know which is more major, becoming a follower of Christ or guarding your heart. They're both major because you can follow follow Jesus and be religious doing it and have no forgiveness or love or repentance in you so you need those number 9 I'm getting close I'm 33 minutes I'm working on it is I've decided to take care of myself I t- decided to take care of my health my exercise my diet some of it I've been getting just a little at late lately uh, just this summer pastor Mark and I decided that we would run And I haven't ran for over 20 years. Um, Like maybe I would jog a little bit, or if there was a sale for shoes, I would run quickly. But but, um, we are actually running. Pastor Mark runs four miles five days a week, and I am now up to five miles, four, whoops, three miles a day, five days a week. The dog, Sam, he runs seven miles five days a week. Because he goes with my husband, and then he goes with me. So it's quite a lot of fun. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians six nineteen to 20, this is the message translation, which I love it. Didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that it can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for? The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. God owns the whole works. So let people see God in and through your body. And we need to take care of our bodies just with our rest, with our diet. You know what? Just pick something to work on, one thing. It started with me running 
a mile downhill <laughs> and then walking back. But you know what? I started. So, and my last one, and I really, you know, I was probably the most intentional where to place this major life decision because I think it's so true. I have decided to keep the Sabbath. My Sabbath not, might not be every single Sunday. For us in our house, my Sabbath is Monday. But you know what? I can't keep going all the time. Yes, God is great and through his word and prayer and leading of the Holy Spirit, we can do great things, but we need to stop. We need to rest. We need to let ourselves rejuvenate. You know, studies have proven that there's more creativity to those that actually stop and rest one day of work. There's more productivity in those business people that actually stop and rest one day a week. You know what? Um, we are made in God's image. When he created the world in the beginning, every time he created, he said it is good. And then what did he do? He stopped. How many times do we finish creating or we're busy in our day, we're doing our business or being a parent? Well, I should have got to the wholesale store and I never did pick up the gift cards and well, I should have done this and this and this and I needed to phone this person and I never got that invoice out to so-and-so. You know, instead of going, you know what? It was a great work day. It was good. And then stopping. We need to stop at the end of our day and reflect on it was good. And we need to take that day in our week and have that Sabbath. And then we need a period of time where there's a Sabbath. Take the vacation. Go away. Stop. And, and let yourself be filled up again. Amen? Hebrews 4, 9 to 12 says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Or he who enters his rest has an... For he, that's a four, for he has entered his rest, hem, has himself also created from his works as God did from his. I think I, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We're actually disobedient when we don't stop and rest. Amen. So just in closing, I just have a couple verses I wanted to leave you. In all this, in all our decisions that we make, two things to keep in mind. Well, one thing basically, have an internal perspective. When you make decisions, look at them in the scope of eternity. You know, yes, quitting a job, getting a new house, moving, you know, those are very major decisions. But when you look at your life being filled with the Word of God, uh, following Christ, guarding your heart, you know, uh, sharing your faith. Those are the decisions that are going to impact the future. Matthew 16, verses 26 to 27 says, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Keep that in perspective. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When you make those major decisions, keep that in mind. Amen? Let's just pray. Lord, I just thank you in the name of Jesus for your word. I thank you for your goodness, for your grace. In Jesus' name in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us free will. You have given us choice. And Lord, I just pray for some here today that you would just cause them in their hearts to just re-shift some of the decisions that are major decisions for them. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Lord, you're great and you're mighty, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wasn't that wonderful? Now I got a list of 10 really important things I need to do.